Hello, and welcome to our AWS Online Tech Talk on S3 Replication. My name is Mo Farhat, and I'm joined by my colleague, Ruhi Dang, on the S3 Product Management Team. Today, we'll learn about the use cases and benefits of S3 Replication, review the latest additions to S3 Replication capabilities, and learn how to configure replication policies to help you meet your compliance, security, and operational efficiency requirements. Let's get started with a review of our agenda. First, we'll review why you should replicate your data on S3, discuss exciting new capabilities of S3 replication, and then we'll review how we can configure them for your needs and share a quick demonstration. Finally, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Let's get started. Amazon S3 customers receive a very high level of availability and durability for their S3 data in every AWS region. Customers often have compliance or business requirements to replicate their data to a second region hundreds or even thousands of miles away from their primary location. S3 replication provides an automatic mechanism to make identical copies of your objects in a destination of your choice. Replication can help you meet data resiliency compliance requirements or place copies of your data close to internal users for operational efficiency or close to external users to minimize their access latency. Those use cases involve replication across AWS regions. Other needs often involve replication within the same AWS region. For example, S3 replication can be used to automatically copy data between your production and test buckets or accounts, helping your teams be more agile. Or to simplify analytics jobs by aggregating logs from multiple services in different buckets to a single bucket for analysis. Finally, replication can also help you protect against unintentional deletes by keeping a copy of your data in a different account while meeting data residency regulations that require that data to stay within a specific AWS region. This can all be done while replicating data to a less expensive, infrequent access storage class, saving you costs along the way. Let's review how S3 replication helps you meet those needs in more detail next. S3 replication is an automatic and asynchronous process that makes an identical copy of your object. That means it retains all metadata that is on the source object, including important fields, such as the object creation date and time and the version IDs. Now, S3 replication has always worked across AWS regions. And customers have asked us to extend that capability so that they can replicate in the same AWS region. We've recently announced exactly that. And now you have the choice of a destination bucket in the same region as the source. Now let's take a closer look at the capabilities of S3 replication. S3 replication is very easy to set up, as we'll show you in a short demo later in our talk. S3 replication gives you the choice of replicating entire buckets or a set of objects under a given prefix or even specific objects that you identify with tags of your choice. Replication begins as soon as you upload an object to S3 that is covered by a replication policy, making an identical copy of that object to the destination bucket. Once you've selected that source data set, you select that destination bucket, which as we've mentioned earlier, can now include buckets in the same region as the source. To enhance security, you can choose to change the ownership of your replica copies and also to replicate them to another account so that no single user or single account can erroneously or unintentionally delete all copies of your data. Depending on your use case for the replica copy, you can choose to keep it in a frequent access storage class or replicate it directly into an infrequent access or an archive storage class such as S3 Glacier. 
you can also specify different lifecycle policies on your source and replica objects to optimize costs based on your access patterns in both the primary and secondary locations if those access patterns differ. Now, since launch in 2015, S3 customers have replicated trillions of objects and exabytes of data. And today, we're making this robust capability even more powerful with S3 replication time control. We're pleased to announce that Amazon S3 replication time control is now available in all AWS commercial regions. Customers are often interested in the time objects take to replicate to their destination. This time can be influenced by factors such as object size, count, and other attributes. When you need additional control and visibility over replication time, you can now use all of the capabilities of S3 replication with a new 15-minute replication time service level agreement and a set of CloudWatch metrics and event notifications that are part of S3 replication time control. Let's find out more. Replication time control gives you predictable replication times such that most objects replicate in seconds. 99% of objects replicate within five minutes and 99.99 .99 of objects replicate within 15 minutes. This replication performance is backed by an SLA that covers the replication of 99.9% .9 of objects in each replicating region pair in any billing month. In the unlikely case that the SLA is not met, you'll receive a credit on the replication time control charges, data transfer and request charges, and the destination storage charges associated with the objects that did not replicate within 15 minutes in the billing period affected. You can view the full service level agreement on the AWS SLA website. S3 replication time control goes further and gives you a set of metrics that you can use to monitor replication for each replication rule. These metrics tell you how many objects and bytes are pending replication and the maximum replication latency of the objects covered by your replication time control policy. You can view these metrics in the S3 management console or in CloudWatch and set up alarms to notify you when any of these metrics exceed a threshold of your choice. These CloudWatch metrics are aggregated for each replication rule. Now you may also want to monitor replication at the object level, which you can with the S3 replication events that we'll review next. In addition to the CloudWatch metrics that we've discussed, S3 replication time control will publish events in the rare instance that an object doesn't complete replication within 15 minutes. Replication time control will also follow up with another event that tells you when that object did successfully replicate to its destination. And like other S3 events that you may have used in the past, you can re receive these replication events using the AWS Simple Queue Service, SQS, the Simple Notification Service, SNS, or use them to invoke a Lambda function as needed. I hope you're as excited as we are about these new capabilities of S3 replication. Now, let's listen to my colleague, Ruhi, as she shows us just how easy S3 replication and replication time control are to set up. Thank you, Mo. Well, now that you've learned about what S3 replication time control does and all the benefits it gives you, we'll dive right into how to set it up. Just like you would while setting up S3 replication, first select what the source and destination regions should be based on your compliance and business requirements. Next, you want to decide what data set to replicate, whether you want to replicate an entire bucket, a prefix, a tag, or a combination of these. Now, once you've chosen your data set, 
you can enable replication time control. You can set up either a new replication rule with replication time control or add it simply to an existing rule. Once you enable this feature, you will begin to see replication metrics for each of your rules. So let's start with what a basic replication configuration looks like when you set this up. And then we look at what it looked like when you enable replication time control on your policy. And then finally, we'll follow up with the demo on the S3 management console. Um, so this is just a basic replication configuration. It sets up a new rule and tells S3 that the object in the tag prefix will be replicated to the destination bucket that you specify. Moving on, to enable replication time control, all you do is add another section that's highlighted here to your replication policy. Now, this is what you do when you were setting this up programmatically. There are many more policy examples that you can find in the S3 replication documentation, including how to set up cross-account or cross-storage class replication. You can also perform this setup in the S3 console, which we're about to see a demo of. Um, so before I jump into the demo straight away, um, what we'll do here is we will create two buckets, a source bucket and then a destination bucket in a separate region. And then we'll set up replication on it. We'll upload a few objects, and then we'll see how the metrics look like. We look at replication metrics, um, and then we'll even set up an alarm on one of them. Uh, so let's let's get into this. So let's create a bucket. Let's call it 1125 test source for today's date. Let's set this up in Northern California. Um, we move on to the next screen. We turn on versioning, which is required to set up replication. On the next screen, block public access is enabled by default. We keep this setting. Let's move on, verify your information, and create a bucket. So we have the source. Now let's create a destination bucket. We'll name it 1125 test dest. And let's pick a region that's a little far away, say Mumbai. Moving on to the next screen. Again, we enable versioning on this bucket. And we'll have block public access that's set up by default. And then you move on to the next screen, verify your information, and click on Create Bucket. So we, have, we now have two buckets, a source and a destination bucket. Let's go into the source bucket, into the Management tab, and click on Replication. This will help us set a replication configuration. We want to set it up on the entire bucket. Uh, go to the next screen and select the destination bucket. That's the one we created. And then let's check replication time control, which is the feature we discussed. Onto the next screen, we create an IAM role, which has the permissions required to replicate your data. Let's call it my rule one and verify the information and save the role. So here you can see all the details of the replication rule, my rule one that I just created. You can see replication time control is enabled. So let's go to the bucket and upload some objects. I have a bunch of test files here that I'm gonna drop into this bucket. You can see these are 12 files, a total of 2.8 gigabytes of data. Um, I'll fast forward a bit as these objects upload. Um, so we have them here. You see those 12 objects that I uploaded. Let's see what the metrics look like. We go to the management tab under metrics and click on replication. Let's look at what happened in the last one hour and then select the rule ID that we just created. You display the graphs and there you have it. So the first one is replication latency. It's telling you what was the maximum time that it took any object to get to the destination. And you can see the max here is about 40 seconds. Um, and you can see those spikes as different objects got uploaded and replicated to the destination, and it's going down to zero at the end since everything reached the destination. Next, we have byte spending replication. So you can see the peak here is about one gigabyte. So objects were uploaded and replicated as we went along, and this is giving you a minute-by-minute minute detail of that. 
The final one is um, operations pending replication. These are the number of operations that have not yet replicated, and they're also going down to zero as everything reached the destination. Let's set up an alarm. So let's pick this operations pending replication metric um, and set up an alarm in CloudWatch. So you click on that quick link, it'll take you to the CloudWatch console where you can set up an alarm. Um, so you see the metric that I selected written here. Um, you can see the metric chart that we saw on the previous screen right here. Uh, we have the source and destination bucket. We want a one minute frequency. It is the rule ID that I created, my rule one. Um, and then we want to set up a threshold. I'm going to pick an arbitrary number of 100 here, which means that every time the number of objects that were pending replication exceed 100, I want an alarm. Uh, the other thing to note here is the missing data treatment should be set as treat missing data as ignore while you're setting this alarm. We want to create a new topic. Let's give it a name. Let's call it say alarms topic 11.25 for today's date and we'll enter a test email ID here for the notification. We call it test topic at amazon.com and we'll set up the topic. So the topic is set up. You've indicated what the threshold is. Moving on to the final screens of setting up the alarm, you give it a name. Let's call it alarm 1125, operations pending, to specify what I was setting up the alarm on. And on the next screen here, you can see the red line, which indicates the level of the alarm, which was 100, and my blue small information here, which was the actual values of the metrics. Um, you see all the information you set up here? It's all there, verify the information, and then simply create alarm. Now the alarm has been set up. You can continue to monitor this, update it, and so forth. Um, so that's it, folks, for the demo. Now that we've seen this demo, and before we get into Q&A, Mo, why don't you tell me, why would a customer want to use replication time control? Well, Ruhi, many customers are under regulatory requirements that ensure that they have a minimum level of business continuity and data protection planning. That often includes maintaining a backup copy of their data that's sufficiently resilient and geographically distant from their original copy of that data so that any event such as a natural disaster or a, a bad actor uh, cannot uh, impact the availability of this critical data. Customers also may make commitments to their own end users that uh, make their data available in, and resilient against um, such disruptions. And with replication time control, customers have the confidence of that predictable replication time that they could use to meet such compliance and business requirements. Now, replication is one thing, Visibility into a replication is another, particularly in these often stressful moments uh, when a failover is necessary. Maybe, Ruhi, you could walk us through how a customer could use replication time control metrics in such a scenario. Sure. Uh, so consider a failover situation where a customer had set up replication time control on their data and they're no longer, for whatever reason, no longer able to access the primary region. Uh, what you could do as a customer is you'd look at the replication latency metric, which gives you the maximum latency at any given point of time. It's a four minute level metric. So you could look at the timestamp and see what the replication latency was at that timestamp and subtract it from the timestamp to get the point in time that you want to fail over to. Uh, so let's say at 9 a.m. your replication latency was 10 minutes, which means that you could take 850 as a good point in time to reverse your applications to. Now, there was another metric we talked about, uh, two other metrics we talked about, bytes pending replication and operations 
pending replication. At that same time point, you could look at these two other metrics and figure out what was the number of objects and the total size of objects that were still pending replication. Together, all of this information will give you a higher confidence in what that failover point should be. That's great, Rohi. These are unique capabilities we're tremendously excited about. While the questions are coming in, let's pull all this together in a customer example. You may have a requirement to store a second copy of important data securely before your application or employees act on it. You can use replication time control to automate this process and replication events to report on compliance. You begin by configuring replication time control to replicate your objects to a second account with ownership override so that no single account can unintentionally delete all copies of your data. And to lower costs, you can store the replica copy in an archival storage class such as S3 Glacier. You can then configure S3 events and Lambda to store records in an RDS table that tracks when an object was stored in the source bucket, whether its replication time exceeded 15 minutes, and if so, when that object successfully replicated. This information allows you to regularly report on compliance to internal or external auditors. Ruhi will walk us through the setup now. We've seen what setting up replication on the console looked like, but let me walk you through how you do this programmatically. Now, as more described in the use case, we want to create a second copy of your data with a different ownership control. For this, you'd start by first setting up two buckets, a source and a destination bucket that are owned by different AWS accounts. You can use the Create Bucket API or a number of other ways to do this programmatically by logging in from different AWS accounts. Once you've created the two buckets, the next step is to add permissions to your destination bucket to allow changing the replica ownership. In replication, the owner of the source object also owns the replica by default, and so to change this behavior, the destination bucket owner needs to provide permissions to the source account owner to change ownership. Here's the bucket policy that you would attach to your destination bucket. The owner of the destination bucket must grant the owner of the source bucket permissions to change replica ownership. In a bucket policy, the principal element that you see here specifies the user, account, service, or another entity that is allowed or denied access to a resource. Reading through this policy, you can see the principle here is the source account, because we want to allow the source account, which is the default owner of the objects, to change the ownership. You can see the effect is allow, and the resource we want to act on is the destination bucket which is specified here towards the end of the policy. And finally, the permission that allows the source bucket owner to change ownership is highlighted here. It's S3 object owner override to bucket owner action. Now that we've created the two buckets and attached the destination bucket policy, the next step is to create an IAM role. Amazon S3 cannot replicate objects without your permission. You grant permission with the IAM role that you specify in your replication configuration. S3 then assumes this role to replicate objects on your behalf. By default, all your Amazon S3 resources, including buckets, objects, and related sub-resources are private. Only the resource owner can access the resource. To read objects from the source bucket and replicate them to the destination bucket, S3 needs permissions to perform these tasks. You grant these permissions by creating an IAM role and specifying that role in your replication configuration. This policy right here will grant the permissions 
specified here to the user or actor that assumes the role. It contains permissions you are allowing or denying and the resource on which the permissions apply. Starting with the first block up here, you can see the effect is to allow and the resource is the source bucket. To replicate objects, S3 requires explicit permissions to read objects from the source bucket and also to read the replication configuration attached to the source bucket so that S3 knows which objects to replicate on your behalf. And the permissions you see in the first block do exactly that. Moving on to the second block, you see the effect is to allow and the resource is the destination bucket. S3 replicate object and S3 replicate delete are permissions for the respective actions on objects in your destination bucket. These actions allow S3 to replicate objects or delete markers to your destination bucket. Finally, since we want to change replica owner, you grant Amazon S3 permissions to change replica ownership by adding the highlighted permission here, object owner override to bucket owner. Now that we have all the permissions in place, we can set up the replication configuration. Which brings us to the last step, where you add a replication configuration to your source bucket. We start by specifying an IAM role that we created previously. You can see that in the first line of the configuration here. This gives S3 the required permissions to replicate your data. You can have multiple rules in a replication configuration if you want to select a different subset of objects. In each rule, you will specify a filter that selects a subset of objects. Here you can see we have one rule and the filter is prefix RTC data. The status of the rule indicates whether it's enabled or disabled. If a rule is disabled, Amazon S3 doesn't perform the actions specified in that rule. The priority right here indicates which rule has a priority when multiple rules apply to the same object. Coming to the destination block, this is where all the fun happens. You specify the name of the destination bucket. Next, what we're doing here is we're changing the storage class of the replica to Glacier. This helps you reduce costs while durably storing a second copy of your data in a colder tier storage class. The next block you see here that's also highlighted, access control translation, changes the owner of the replicated objects to the destination account. The final two sections in this configuration enable the feature replication time control that we talked about in detail today in this particular rule. It also sets a 15 minute threshold on the replication events. The 15 minute threshold is the only acceptable value today. The setup is completed after this step and any objects that you upload to your source bucket under the prefix RTC data will now be replicated to your destination bucket. The destination account will inherit ownership of those objects and the objects will be stored in the Glacier storage class. Great. Now that we've configured the replication policy, let's take a look at how we can use events to keep a record of any objects that deviate from the replication time control SLA. S3 replication time control will publish an event for any object that doesn't replicate in 15 minutes. Like other S3 events, you can invoke a Lambda function based on these replication events and use Lambda to create a record of these events in an RDS database table that you specify. For example, you can use the S3 event object created put to create a database record of objects stored to your source bucket and the replication event operation missed threshold to create a record of the name, size, and version ID of any object that took longer than 15 minutes to replicate. You can see a portion of the event format here. You may want to also record the replication rule ID, destination bucket, 
an S3 operation highlighted here. You can also append that object record with information from the follow-on event operation replicated after threshold that tells you when the replication task completed for that object. Let's take a look at the event format here. Notice the added replication time element highlighted. That element will tell you the time in ISO format when replication completed. You can then use these records to build a regular compliance report that documents any deviation from the 15 minute replication threshold and provide that to your auditors. With that, we'll be happy to take your questions.